And welcome everyone to the July Atmosphere Collaboration Team Meeting um, as part of IARPIC. Um, my name is Andrew. I am a member of the Secretariat, um, so I help organize these meetings. Um, and I am really thrilled to be able to um, uh, present or initiate this month's uh, Collaboration Team Meeting. Um, just as a few notes, this meeting is being recorded. So if you know anyone who will not be able to make it today, um, we will post the notes and a YouTube link to this pre to this recorded lecture, which you can then share afterwards. Um, please keep yourself on mute. Um, and any questions we you have, we're going to wait till the end of the presentations, and then from there we will go ahead and open it up for discussion. Um, the one other note that I want to make is that um, we um, the secretariat is. Um, starting a accessibility poll to, um, about these collaboration team meetings. So I'm looking for the link right now that I can share with you. Um, it is in the agenda for this month's meeting, which I'm posting the link for here. Um, so sorry, you have to click on two links. Um, but this is just a short survey about the accessibility of these meetings. And if you have any ideas how we can make them more accessible for people, we would appreciate your feedback. Um, and before we really get started, if you would go ahead and just write your name affiliation, and if this is your first, thank you, Heiss. Heiss has posted the accessibility poll in the chat. Um, and if you could go ahead and post your name, your affiliation, and this is your first um, collaboration team meeting in the chat, um, this is a great way for us to just get to know people and welcome you if this is your first time. Um, and while everyone's doing that, I will turn it over to Heiss. Thanks, Drew. Um, I'm actually very, I apologize for this, but I'll do they it. Just started, they just started mowing the lawn across the street. I'm happy to do it, very Heiss. Loud on this side. So, okay, Heiss DeBurr and myself, Barry Leffer, were the co chairs for the Atmospheric Collaboration Team for IARCPIC. IARCPIC is the international. I'm sorry, Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. And the goal is to bring together leaders from 16 US agencies, departments, and offices across the US federal government to enhance research in the Arctic. It was created in 1984 under the Arctic Research and Policy Act. The act called for a comprehensive national policy focused on research needs and objectives in the Arctic. It established IARCPIC and, its, and our sibling organization, the Arctic Research Commission, to help implement the act. And in July 2010, a presidential memo is established IARCPIC as the interagency working group of the National Science and Technology Council Committee on the Environment. And it now reports directly to the Committee on the Environment. And the director of the National Science Foundation serves as the IARCPIC's chair. And so part of the, um, there's several collaboration teams in IARCPIC and, and this is, the monthly meeting for the atmosphere collaboration team. And we have a number of performance elements that we try to, um, to do to focus our efforts to enhance this collaboration. And this is a, a special meeting for us because we're also collaborating with our cryospheric friends. Um, and so without wasting more time about, uh, and afterwards I'd be happy, Heiss and I would be happy to answer questions about our pick and what, what our future plans are with, for the atmospheric collaboration team. But I'd like to have our speakers talk about ARC-6. It's a, it's a, a planned uh, field campaign in the Arctic that's looking at both Earth's radiation budget, it's, it's looking at sea ice and clouds, and we have three of the members of the team that wrote the white paper for this um, uh, field campaign to give presentations about those three areas. And so without any further ado, Sebastian Schmidt of the University of Colorado, would you like to start us off? Yeah, thank you very much, Barry. And also thank you very much uh, to the entire team, so Heiss and Andrew, for extending the invitation to us and giving us the opportunity to talk about ARC-6. Um, I say us because, as you said, there are uh, three of us, you know, they're my co-speakers, of course, are Lynette uh, from NASA Goddard um, as our cryospheric um, representative here. 
then Patrick Taylor uh, from NASA Langley, who represents clouds, and then myself from the University of Colorado representing uh, radiation and remote sensing. And I've been the, uh, the overall coordinator of the white paper. Um, so the fact that there are three of us here already tells you that this white paper was um, very long in coming. Um, so there, there are many contributors here. Uh, it's been a long process. Uh, starting out with, I should really say importantly, Matt Shoup, um, Bill Smith, um, and Greg McFarquhar and myself getting together. Initially, we wanted to coordinate this with Mosaic, believe it or not. And here we are now, and we're um, shooting for a campaign in 24. So you had ample time, I think, already uh, to study the, uh, the cover page here. So you know that this is now out as a call in Roses. Um, so the proposals, I believe, are due on October 15th. I don't think that this will be delayed, um, but I don't, I don't know. Um, the full white paper is accessible under this link, and you can see here the title page with the sheer number of these uh, contributors. Also, this picture here, I took that from the cockpit of the C-130 during um, the NASA Arise campaign. Um, so you see that snow underneath there. So. Um, I'm going to show you this arc six in one slide um, information here, um, which uh, tells you again when this happens. So in the summer and what it is about, uh, Barry actually told you um, what generally it is about. Uh, so the surface radiation budget and sea ice melt and the connections between those, uh, but also really importantly, the cloud life cycle and how that is affected by aerosols, um, the regions. Um, we are targeting are the north of Greenland region, which is um, not that often sampled, actually, plus the Fram Strait. There are going to be two aircraft operating out of Thule. Um, why is it this, um, this area? Um, we'll talk about that a little bit shortly. Uh, timing wise, what we're thinking right now is that we're going to have two campaigns. So it's one one single investigation, but it's split up into two campaigns, um, approximately four weeks each, and um, uh, uh, covering roughly the melt season. Um, and we're probably going to go home in between, leaving the aircraft parked up there. So there are going to be two platforms, our high flyer carrying remote sensing and drop zones, plus our low flyer carrying in situ instrumentation, um, plus again remote sensing. Um, I, you know that this is going to get funded from Helmerings uh, and also Thorsten's programs uh, in conjunction. Um, and this is here the overview of the science questions and how they came about. So to orient uh, you here, uh, on the top left you have the radiation science questions, and this is originally what this started with. Um, uh, in, so together with the remote sensing objective here at the bottom right, but then later on we added the cloud life cycle science questions as more members joined our team for obvious reasons, because we're looking for the connections between radiative processes and um, you know, what um, brings clouds to life and what makes them die. And then our latest edition was this important sea, sea ice edition. The way this um, presentation today is organized is that I'm going to talk uh, about the radiation um, goals and the remote sensing goals, um, followed by Patrick who's going to speak to the cloud life cycle and Lynette uh, to the cryosphere. And we'll briefly then discuss some implementation aspects. And I believe that that's where people are going to have the most questions. So let me show you this area here. So why that area? So first of all, the north of Greenland um, or the region north of the north coast um, and going all the way to the pole uh, is uh, relatively Undersample, but it's also at the same time what we call the last bastion of multi year sea ice. And it's very interesting because it has melt ponds and these things. And it also has this outflow region here where the sea ice leaves through the Fram Strait. Plus, it has essentially access to the conveyor belts of atmospheric moisture, aerosol transport from the lower latitudes. Um, which sometimes occurs through the Fram Strait, sometimes through the Canadian Arctic. Right now, it's actually happening from over Russia, so coming through um, east of Svalbard. Um, more on that later. So two bases here, Thule, which is an Air Force, US Air Force base, um, and potentially Svalbard over here. 
And then these are some of the distances here going to the North Pole uh, of this magic triangle. All right, what's the context of ARC-6 um, in uh, other missions? So not coincidentally, in gray here, we actually have um, these airborne campaign bracketed in icebreaker activities. So Shiba, uh, um, more than two decades ago now, and also Mosaic, which just happened. So filled in with these other activities, NASA has been quite active in the area. I wanna mention that actually missions such as FireX actually started um, the retrievals, the atmospheric retrievals that are currently being used by the US system. So it was a really important campaign. Um, I also want to mention, because uh, this, uh, in our mission is a NASA mission, of course, Arctas um, in 2008, uh, and then Arise that I previously mentioned. Um, there are also numerous other activities by other US funding agencies, of course, um, the DOE, I probably don't even need to mention, but I should uh, point that out. There are now in uh, the recent past German activities, for example, A Cloud, um, which happened in the Svalbard region. And uh, AC3 is going to take place from Norway and Svalbard and Northeastern Canada next year. And I'll actually be participating there and hopefully learn a lot. But last not least is Operation Icebridge, which made a tremendous impact, especially on the flight planning that we pursued in Arise, uh, because it brought in a completely new approach to sampling uh, radiation fields in the Arctic with something that was pre-planned. And I want to point out that Lynette um, is um, one, of the, one of the leaders uh, or was one of the leaders of OIB. So uh, going just briefly um, into uh, the radiation piece uh, in just a few minutes, um, we learned a lot from this Arise campaign uh, of which you show you. This is from a BAMS article by Bill Smith, um, where, show, where you see these what we call lawnmower patterns where we statistically sample the radiation fields here in especially the marginal ice zone around the sea ice minimum in um, 2014. Um, what what motivated originally this whole endeavor was um, to see how well we could um, how well the fluxes that are derived by the series modus combination uh, compare with something that's measured by aircraft under different conditions. So you see here there is overcast ocean uh, all the way going to overcast in the marginal ice zone. These are all upwelling fluxes, so short wave um, uh, at the top and long wave at the bottom. And um, you can see that this comparison actually works out fairly well. So, but I want to remind you that this is the upwelling. Uh, on the next slide, we're actually seeing the downwelling, um, this time spectral, but that doesn't matter. This paper that just came out this year, um, and it shows here the downwelling measured spectral flux under this cloud field that's shown here. And uh, it actually showed us that um, many, um, Many of these occasions, the clouds are simply too thin to actually be detected by MODIS. And so um, you saw that in a disconnect of these, um, of these spectral fluxes. Oh, this is actually the upwelling um, flux, but um, the, I want to point out that this, uh, this problem of not detecting, especially these thin clouds from space, is a big problem for the long wave, um, for the long wave surface budget for obvious reasons. Um, so, and that's one of the things we want to capture um, with this campaign here. So we want to distinguish between the relative contributions of these very thin, low level clouds that sometimes go undetected in synoptically forced, you know, thicker cloud systems. And of course, um, that can't be separated from the surface reflectance. And so I just want to really briefly say, aside from these science questions, which you can read, what the top level goals and deliverables are that we're hoping for, and they go together with this remote sensing and modeling perspective, we want to be able at some point to really start the next generation of um, passive imagery cloud retrievals in the Arctic, plus the next generation surface reflectance um, retrievals for obvious reasons. You've got to know um, the uh, temporally and um, spatially dependent um, uh, albedo um, in the region for, um, again, for obvious reasons, for melt processes. Um, 
So those are kind of operational goals that we want to support with our suborbital measurements. Um, so it's almost a kind of a technical, um, a technical goal that we have there and yet very important. Um, this third bullet point here is also important because if you are worried about, um, if you want to know something about the melt processes and how quickly you melt um, in certain regions, um, you really have to worry about the cumulative radiative surface budget over the entire melt season, which is not simple. In order to accomplish that, you can't just do spot checks with, with your aircraft, but you really need to link your observations to the simultaneous satellite observations, which actually extend in time and space. And this, um, this is almost all I have for radiation. I'm just within my 10 minutes, 11. Uh, I want to say that the biggest criticism that we've received over time is to say, well, the Arctic is huge. How, you can, how can you possibly characterize all of these contributing factors in this huge sampling region? The answer is we can't. Uh, and so we, can, uh, we came to this conclusion that we're pursuing what we call a regime-based approach, where we really essentially um, dissect the problem in um, a multidimensional parameter space, in this case for radiation that happens to be surface albedo on the x-axis and um, the short wave and the long wave fluxes on the y-axis. And you see these red spots here. This, these are basically um, um, where you have lots of occurrences where the atmosphere surface um, system basically resides a number of time times. And this is from a paper from, from the A-Cloud campaign in BAMS as well, the Spanish paper here. And what, we've, what we're striving to do is essentially characterize these four blobs in parameter space separately and link them to satellite and modeling and then basically piecing together the radiation um, piece of the overall ARC-6 um, investigation. And having basically primed you on the regime-based approach, I now want to transition to Patrick, who's going to tell you all about life cycle processes. All right, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I'm not going to be able to talk too much about regimes, but we will mention them for sure, because the regimes are important for the, the cloud processes as well as the radiation. <clears throat> Uh, thanks for the this time, everybody, to uh, share with you some of this, what we think is very interesting science. It was three years in the making to put this whole uh, document and plan together, concept for ARC-6. But I think we have a really good concept uh, that's going to, uh, once implemented, be able to really advance our understanding of Arctic cloud radiation and uh, how, the, how this influences the, the sea ice. So next slide. So to step back quickly, I know uh, Sebastian provided some motivations for the radiation aspects. I wanted to provide as context some uh, some uh, motivation for the some of the cloud questions that we have. And so, uh, for all of you who are familiar or think about Arctic and the clouds, uh, you're aware that the clouds are a key uncertainty in climate models and in all modeling, really atmospheric modeling in the Arctic, but particularly in climate models. And that's characterized here as plot that we have on the bottom left, where we, a few years ago, we compared the different climate models and their uh, seasonal cycle of cloud radiative effect at the surface uh, with the series observations. And we found some really big biases, uh, including you know, clouds being too reflective in summertime and being not quite uh, have a, having too weak of a warming effect in wintertime in general. So these, these radiative biases in the models are really important to influencing how the Arctic system evolves, and particularly the sea ice. But we know the root of these biases actually is in the processes of the clouds. And one of those key processes that models differ a lot is in the microphysics. And that's summarized on the right panel, where this is just one example of the microphysics, which is highlighting the temperature dependence, which is on x-axis, with the different amounts of supercool liquid fraction. So in these clouds, we often find these low thin clouds that Sebastian mentioned, we often find that they're mixed phase and, and contain you know, a mixture of supercooled liquid and ice particles. Uh, the different bars on this plot uh, from a few years ago uh, are showing the temperature dependence of supercooled liquid fraction in several different climate models. And we see there's quite a varied range of how, uh, how much supercooled liquid a different climate model is able to produce at different temperatures. So you know, these are two key uncertainties that, we, that we're guiding the Arctic science and that, that we hope to be able to advance with some of these uh, with our observations. Uh, next slide. 
In addition, uh, another key uncertainty in the Arctic that directly impacts the clouds when it comes to both climate models and numerical weather prediction and reanalysis are the uncertainties in the thermodynamic profile. I know in Sebastian's slides earlier, he mentioned, uh, he, he showed this plot on the bottom left here by uh, from Michal, and this is showing a comparison of the thermodynamic structure uh, in uh, MERA2 versus the ARISE observations, which were taken in 2014. And what you see here, there's some large biases in the temperature profile, especially as you get closer to the surface, where the MERA2 data tends to be much warmer than the aircraft. And so, you know, we often think about clouds is that the first order effect on clouds is, is that they're interacting with their environment and the thermodynamics and, and the temperature and the humidity of the environment has a really big impact on the clouds. And so we need to consider not just the cloud physical processes and uh, advance that uncertainty, we also have to understand and, and try to improve these biases in the thermodynamic uh, representation of the lower troposphere as well. And that's further highlighted on this right panel, uh, which is a paper that was uh, from a, a former postdoc of mine that was just accepted a few weeks ago, where we use the ARISE data, in particular, the cloud condensate and, and, and cloud property data from the ARISE uh, in-situ aircraft and compared them with the ASR here, which stands for Atmospheric System Reanalysis. And, and the 2D histogram that you're seeing here is one other way that we can dissect our clouds into atmospheric regimes. And here being x-axis is temperature and y-axis is uh, specific humidity, but there are other ways you can think about this too that we've, we've thought about and plan to uh, look at further in the planning and implementation. What we see here is that there are pretty large differences in the cloud condensate and that these, these biases in the reanalysis uh, in this case are in fact regime dependent, meaning you know the biases are, are larger <laughs> and the differences between the model and the observations are larger in different regimes than, than in other regimes. So that's a, a really key aspect uh, that, that we hope to advance with uh, ARC-6. Next slide. So uh, I won't, I, I, I will, has, I will uh, ref refrain from going through this schematic in detail, even though I really would like to, uh, but you know, in settling on uh, ARC-6 science questions and hypotheses that were used to guide, you know, the approach uh, and the observations that were needed for, to address the cloud science, uh, a small group of us sat down and developed this conceptual picture of what we know about how these low thin clouds that were really, that are, that are, we focus on for, that are key in the region, our region of, of focus, uh, and put together this conceptual picture. And I like to say that uh, just point out that Anne Fridland did a lot of work on this and really was the, the brains behind putting all these different pieces together, including, you know, the role of, so in the beginning of the cloud life cycle, the role of long wave uh, clear sky cooling and, and large scale ascent, which leads to supersaturation. Uh, but in general, we find that these clouds don't uh, form when you get super saturation with respect to ice, whether they tend to require super saturation with respect to liquid before you start really starting to see condensation and then later on uh, initial ice formation. But there are these important links between uh, radiative cooling, in cloud turbulence, and the uh, aerosols and microphysical properties that lead to you know, different drop size distributions and uh, the proportion of ice versus liquid that are key questions that will show up in the next, uh, uh, in, in the Arctic science question. So this really, this picture here, which is described more fully in the white paper itself, uh, is really was key to developing the Arctic science. So I encourage you to take a look at it uh, later. Next slide. So in the remaining few minutes I have, I just wanted to highlight a few of the, the, the ARC-6 science questions related to clouds, as well as the key hypotheses that we generated that's gonna guide our uh, the measurements that we need and our approach. So this first question, uh, 2.1, is really focused on understanding uh, what are the different cloud uh, processes and influences on the cloud properties and evolution, including microphysics, uh, the thermodynamic structure, the aerosol composition, and CCN and IMP, so CCN, cloud condensation nuclei, INP, ice nucleating particles, as well as precipitation, and how all these different processes uh, interact together to influence the cloud life cycle and evolution. Uh, and we have regimes on the right side here because this is a question we would like to look across different atmospheric regimes by, again, slicing and dicing the data and, uh, and taking measurements in different atmospheric conditions, uh, as well as you know, focusing building regimes on different radiation and surface type conditions as well. Uh, so we have a couple uh, key hypotheses that we that are going to guide us here. Uh, first, 
the first being that these cloud systems we expect to be formed and maintained by advection from lower latitudes and be in and be influenced by the radiative cooling as well as being influenced strongly by these the sparsity or the amount of the concentration of ice nucleating particles that we find uh, secondly you know where these clouds and the vertical structure of these clouds form we we think are going to be strongly influenced by the pre-existing water vapor structure and that's going to dictate where uh, in the atmosphere you know what altitude in that lower troposphere we see the initial cloud formation and then ensuing radiative cooling and turbulence and lastly uh, this last hypothesis is just really expression that the immersion freezing and, and this is supported by recent um, lab experiments uh, and uh, that Paul DeMott, a member of the, the white paper writing team, uh, took part in uh, that immersion freezing is really responsible for most of the ice formation that we see in these clouds. And so we hope to be able, we plan to go out and test these hypotheses and our approach is, is to, to, to leverage our two aircraft uh, that, that we'll have to make measurements of the microphysics as well as uh, the thermodynamic profile information and the aerosol atmosphere composition and to do this in uh, from the surface up to five kilometers to really characterize and leverage leverage the radiative uh, the remote sensing instruments that we have to really get at the spatial and capture some of the temporal variability as well uh, well the plan for these slices and to sample these conditions in the clouds both below in and above the clouds in a range of meteorological conditions uh, next next slide so the next science question here is, is somewhat different, but, uh, but certainly related. And this really keys on the new appreciation, I, could, I would say, uh, in specifically uh, those of us who think a lot about Arctic amplification and Arctic climate change and what's driving it, this new appreciation for the role of air mass modification. You know, as, lower, as warm, moist air masses come into the Arctic from lower latitudes, how is that energy parsed and what influences how that, that, that new air kind of evolves? And that's kind of the, at the heart of this science question uh, 2.2 and our hypotheses, which are that we hypothesize that the, this air mass transformation process is going to be substantially influenced by whether this air is cloudy or clear and what those uh, properties of the air mass really are that are moving out from the lower latitudes into our domain out over sea ice. Uh, secondly, we expect to see that most of our atmospheric moisture and aerosols are going to enter the study domain episodically through these transport events and uh, versus being locally generated. And we think that it could take us up to a week or more that for this lower latitude air to really transform and become known as Arctic air. So our approach to characterize this is to take to lever again leverage the two aircraft and do uh, perform some Lagrangian flights on you know, consecutive or near consecutive days to really track the evolution and co-evolution between the air and the surface and the clouds and aerosol properties and the radiation uh, along the way. And so uh, next slide. The final question here, so I'm sure my time is up, uh, is to really focus on what's the, what's the role of aerosols in the evolution of these clouds and these cloud systems. In particular, focus on the influence of local versus remote. And this science question is really motivated by, by the changing Arctic and that in this changing Arctic where there's going to, it's less icy, less sea ice cover, we expect to see a change in uh, the local sources of aerosols. You know, for the most part, uh, historically, the, it's, the aerosol has been transported into the Arctic and that's been much more of a dominant source of aerosol to the Arctic until more recently. Now we expect that you know the decline in sea ice cover could lead to more uh, papers have been published on increasing kind of dust from uh, places where glaciers have melted out and that could lead to more dust which could lead to more ice nucleating particles uh, and as well as potential sources of local biogenic uh, emissions as well. And so that really motivates this question. Uh, our, our plan for this and to test our hypotheses which are that we expect to find more local sources of, of CCN and INP over the ice-free ocean and not as many over the ice covered. Uh, but we also expect that the thermodynamic properties of the atmosphere are likely to be more important to the overall cloud evolution than these episodic transport events with the input of new aerosols. So uh, to our overall approach for this is, again, to get these microphysical process, uh, properties and of the clouds and thermodynamics, but also to leverage the uh, natural gradients in the aerosol environments and look at pristine and, and, and more higher uh, aerosol concentration air masses in these different meteorological regimes and have the, those uh, synergistic measurements together to be able to characterize those and understand what's driving the differences in those processes. So uh, so thanks for, for listening and hopefully we can get some more discussion on this. But So for this, next I'd like to turn it over to Lynette 
to uh, pro provide an overview of the science, uh, the cryospheric science questions for Arc Six. Awesome. Yeah. So um, I'm Lynette, and I was, um, like Patrick said, I'm going to talk about the cryospheric focus. So um, the main motivation for the um, the the, the CA aspect of Arc Six is that we really want to understand the evolution of the sea ice throughout the summer months and um, learn how the atmosphere is affecting the sea ice and how and then in turn how the sea ice is affecting the atmosphere. Um, so this figure on the left is from a very recent paper that's showing the difference between observations of sea ice extent and, and sea six members in um, March and in September. September is on the right. And you can see that specifically at the end of the summer, the differences are, are really, really large compared to the observations. And one of the reasons for this is because models often represent the sea ice as a frozen, non-evolving non -evolving slab with, with uniform thickness. And they often do not have a snowpack on the thickness, I mean, on the sea ice. And if they do, it's often, you know, doesn't change. Um, they also tend to have an an overly simplified albedo term that doesn't necessarily evolve throughout the summer months. Um, but in fact, in the summer, the sea ice is highly variable. Um, you have melt ponds that form, you have snow that falls, um, the sea ice breaks up um, and is a very dynamic. So models really need to um, capture these things in order to create a better sea ice cover. Um, yeah, so the, the, the summer sea ice thickness and surface characteristics, along with the evolution of the sea ice, uh, remain highly uncertain throughout the melt season um, and also difficult to capture in both satellite measurements and to reproduce in modeling. And from Arc 6, we hope that these process, process level insights into how the sea ice, snow, and the surface characteristics alter the temperature and humidity structure above the sea ice and also um, the air mass transformation of the overlying atmosphere, and this would greatly improve our understanding of the Arctic climate system, system as a whole, and for predicting the sea ice evolution through improved surface parameterizations in climate models. So next slide. So the, the main overarching uh, cryospheric focus question is how do the two-way interactions between the surface property and atmospheric forcings affect this the sea ice evolution during the melt season. And the overall goal for this uh, cryospheric science aspect of ARC-6 is to gain an improved understanding of the coupling between the sea ice and the atmosphere during the melt season, specifically to understand, again, how the surface evolution is affecting the atmosphere above, and also how to understand how the atmospheric forcings are altering the sea ice evolution throughout the melt season. So we hope to, our main overarching goals are to improve large scale models of sea ice surface property parameterizations in the, during the melt season, um, improve our understanding of the sea ice atmospheric coupling and improve this coupling in climate models, and also to improve the interpretation of satellite retrievals of sea ice properties during the melt season. Next slide. So um, this is our first, uh, science question. Um, so it's we want to learn how the evolution of the sea ice, so the topography, thickness, and the albedo, snow, all of that affect clouds, air mass evolution, and near surface temperature and humidity structure. And we again, like um, with Patrick and the cloud section, we have a series of hypotheses which we hope to answer. So um, we hope to be able to show the um, the low cloud um, coupling with the, or not coupling, but the low, how low clouds increase over more um, heavily ponded sea ice in the summer and areas with more leads. We hope to um, find a relationship between the surface characteristics and how they evolve and how they affect the lower temperature, lower tropospheric temperature and humidity structure. And also we want to be able to split up the sea ice into different regimes and kind of look at how these different sea ice regimes have, they have an effect on cloud properties, cloud liquid water and the cloud ice water content, content as well. Next slide. So um, the second science question is looking at um, what the combined impact of initial surface conditions and changing atmospheric forcings 
um, have on the evolution of sea ice during the melt season. And again, we have three hypotheses. One um, is that the sea ice topography and the snow depth will dictate the location and the geometry of the melt ponds and the sea ice flows throughout the melt season. The other one is looking at how are the initial conditions at the, at the end of the spring season and the beginning of the melt season. Um, how do these affect um, the sea ice throughout the, the summer melt? And also, um, we hope to show that the sensitivity of the sea ice melt to different atmospheric forcings is surface regime independent as well. Um, next slide. So in order to do this, we want to sample these different sea ice regimes and the surface conditions at the start of the melt season, and then to revisit these similar areas or these same sea ice regimes throughout the summer so we can um, see, how they, see how these evolve. So we're going to have to measure the, the freeboard of the sea ice, the snow thickness, um, the amount of leads. We would want to know the albedo as well. Um, and melt pond coverage. And the plan is to kind of determine where these different sea ice regimes are at the beginning of the melt season before we begin to fly, fly over these, these, these ice regimes and then forecast where they're gonna be at a later date so we can fly over them again and measure them. Um, so we need to do some kind of Lagrangian sea ice parcel tracking as well. And the great thing about where we're being based at is we're based out of Northern Greenland and um, we're flying over parts of um, Svalbard and uh, the Fram Strait. And here we can, we can, we can um, measure thick multi-year sea ice. It tends to have a thicker snowpack and that's more compact and um, moves a lot less north of Greenland. So we can, we can um, you know, track the drift much better. And then also looking at first year ice, thinner, um, variable snowpack, and one that's moving faster um, along the Fram Strait. So next slide. So we want to be able to monitor the evolution of the sea ice, but we also need to take these atmospheric measurements as well. So we would hope that the low flyer plane would have the measurements of, you know, freeboard snow thickness, uh, visible imagery and albedo, temperature, things like that, and then the high flyers or above to measure more of the atmospheric conditions so that we can kind of link them together. So I went fast because I knew we were short on time, so <laughs> I'll pass it back to Sebastian <laughs> to finish Great. up. Thank you both. And I just have two slides really on implementation, which is relatively short. Uh, so this here is just a summary of uh, the more detailed tables which you can find in the white paper. Uh, and it's um, divided into the high flyer instrumentation, the so-called low flyer instrumentation, and last not least, satellite observations and surface observations. Of course, we um, don't know who is going to propose in these calls um, and who is going to get funded. But in general, really, the idea is uh, to have the combinations of uh, the combination of these two planes where the focus, the emphasis really for the high flyer is the remote sensing. In other words, uh, there is going to be an imager, um, maybe even multi angle radiances from there. Um, there is hopefully going to be a LIDAR of some kind um, and uh, there are going to be drop sons. Um, so um, on the low flyer, on the other hand, that's not just going to have in situ instruments. Um, so let's say um, cloud uh, size drop, uh, you know, cloud drop size distributions, you know, aerosol properties, radiative property properties, gases, radiation, etc. Uh, but it's also going to include some remote sensors, and the reason is one that um, from practical practical standpoint, not all remote sensors will simply fit on the high flyer. And secondly, um, some of the remote sensors have to be closer to the clouds than is possible from a high flyer. So for example, the radar instruments need need to need to be closer to the cloud. Uh, we're also hoping to have a Raman LIDAR, among other things, which needs to be closer um, to just single that instrument out for one second. Um, so in contrast to the usual drop sound um, profiles, that um, instrumentation, some novel instrumentation, has the potential to actually deliver us curtains 
um, of water vapor and temperature, very much like we are already getting from HSRL um, for, for aerosol properties and, and cloud properties. And I think that, you know, in part, this new instrumentation, these instrumentation developments will hopefully lead to some changes and improvements uh, in the science that we can accomplish. So let me just show you one thing that we're currently um, engaged in. There are a few of us um, uh, who are getting together regularly, looking at the weather, essentially, using multiple tools here. So there multiple flight planning tools that have been developed in the past um, one of which you're seeing here on the on the top uh, on the bottom right um, the way this works is essentially that you get uh, in this case uh, German uh, well it's either ECMWF or the German weather service data but you can also read in NOAA data and others and you basically plot this over time and you can over plot a flight track here and then you can do things like you can plot essentially curtains of all kinds of parameters, wind speeds, etc. Um, so what we're trying to do in these dry run exercises is to say, well, we're going to go back to the priority table that we developed during the white paper. You can, you can find that um, and, and read its uh, justification there. And we're going to say, well, what would we fly under these conditions? And what are kind of the holdups that we're finding currently. And let me just give you two examples. So first of all, there is this first regime, which we call the clear sky observations, which we thought was going to be awfully rare up there. And so we said, well, if we want to characterize this, um, the sea ice um, properties, radiation and cryospherically, we better prioritize these as highly as we can. So whenever we have clear sky, we're going to go there. We found that this tends to occur a little bit more often than we anticipated, at least right now. The other thing that we found was that for this, for these transport events that Patrick mentioned, um, uh, they tend to not occur through the Fram Strait as much as actually coming over from Russia. And then, of course, you have to ask yourself, well, how do you actually fly this, um, considering this, that this is coming in um, from east of Svalbard and we're hitting the boundaries of where we have access to uh, in terms of the, um, the, the ATC, right? So these are all things that we're weighing and we're coming up with a number of different um, flights right now and we're revisiting the weather afterwards. I also want to point out that there is um, a dry run that was currently executed um, for AC3, so the, the German campaign next year. There is a summary paper available on that one. It's very interesting. It summarizes uh, the conditions and what they thought they were going to fly from Svalbard. So with that, I'm going to close here. I'm going to come back to the area of operation to open the floor for any questions that you might have. So thank you again for the co-speakers. Great. And please ask your questions. Thanks, Sebastian and Lynette and um, Patrick. Uh, looks like Jack has his hand up. Jack, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just curious. And I, it's kind of a question for Lynette and uh, Patrick both. But um, when you talk about characterizing the sea ice, how successfully can you do that entirely from airplanes? Or do you actually plan to have people out there making you know, sort of the classic measurements? And and that's an in, that's one question, and you know, and my my thinking is, if there are a lot of low clouds over your ice flows, can you really get under there with any kind of imagers and do a decent job? But the other thing that struck me as a as a puzzle or a challenge is, from Patrick's point of view, you want to do these Lagrangian flights to watch the evolution of air masses that are coming in from lower latitudes and becoming Arctic, and Lynette wants to do Lagrangian flights that follow the drift of sea ice and i'm i'm not a gambler but to, to see that you can do both on any significant fraction of flight seems ridiculously long odds to me <laughs> not to mention getting a sweet spot where sebastian can get the stack of radiation measurements that he always wants you know once or twice a campaign that happens <laughs> Well, well, actually, oh, okay, go ahead, Patrick. I was just going to start by saying the first thing is that, you know, we're looking at having um, at least 150 
flight hours for the high for each airplane, I believe, something like that. So, you know, we would be flying out significantly uh, a good amount of time anyway uh, to be able to capture all these things. But but you're right in that it, it is going to be a challenge to be able to balance the science objectives, and that is something that once um, you know the white paper has laid out a lot of good science and once we have a selected uh peer-reviewed selected science full science team with an instrument suite you know when we make an instrumentation or implementation plan we will probably need to refine those um that science um as far as some of the other things i think sebastian was going to jump in on is the ability to get uh underneath the clouds uh we had challenges with that during a rise but we think that that wouldn't be as much of an issue here although sebastian you can jump in the other thing I'll just say uh, is that we do, we we want, uh, we, we plan to characterize the surface, you know, with remote sensors, um, radiatively and with the imagers, um, but also it would be great. And I've been exploring this. So if anybody is interested in trying to help me explore this, I think it would be uh, fantastic. If we could get some ice mass buoys out on the surface somewhere out here that we were flying over. <laughs> If there's a way or if anybody has information how we can make that happen I, i've been emailing some folks and had some success in in in, in uh you know a holding pattern with emails but i think it'd be great if we could find something at the surface but that's not something that is currently in the white paper but some that that nasa is planning to fund thanks patrick um i, I actually had a couple follow-up questions to that if, it, if that works um one is uh, this this under the clouds thing it's um, it's tricky, I think, at thinking about our experiences on Mosaic and particularly on leg four, where the ship basically drifted right through your two circles here. Um, there was a lot of fog. I think there was one clear day out of the whole leg, um, maybe two. And I wonder to what extent you have looked at how well the models that you're using for your dry runs capture that phenomenon. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how well they might capture the fog. And this is usually like one or 200 meters worth of fog. Uh, so it might be something to look into just to confirm that even if there aren't clouds um, at, you know, seven, 800, 900 meters, that there's not this near surface layer that's hanging out that still might block some of your study area. But you're absolutely right, Heis. Um, and actually just this past Friday, you know, Amy Solomon and Paquita and Patrick and I talked about fog precisely. Uh, of course, it's really hard to really verify what did happen because, you know, we don't have the observations. Um, but, you know, just even verifying whether Amy's model, for example, gets the liquid water path correct or, or not, you know, that's going to be really valuable. But, you know, if you think about it, we actually do have to fly out there and, you know, go through the region with, with a LIDAR. So, I mean, right now, the approach is nominally that the high flyer goes out in a sort of um, scouting um, pattern. Uh, so the HSRL will check, well, is this actually cloud free or not, you know, which is supposed to be cloud free. And it will definitely detect fog if we had it. Only if it confirms that conditions are favorable, will the low flyer go out and actually uh, then attempt to get under the clouds. But there is no question about it that in many cases we won't get under the clouds. I mean, we, we simply have to be prepared for that, which actually makes these surface observations all the more important. Actually, just this morning, Hal forwarded me an email from Italian researchers who have a station in Thule with radiation measurements. There are also some Danish um, activities right in Greenland. There are the Canadians observing um, the, in Eureka and other places. And there is even the potential for getting, I mean, I'm keeping fingers crossed, uh, to get a Swedish icebreaker, Uden, into the area in the summer of 24. So all of those are possibilities, and, and we simply don't know what's going to happen. I just briefly wanted to speak to Jack's question, though, about Lagrangian, and then maybe Lynette can contradict me um, uh, if applicable. So Lagrangian for cryo and Lagrangian for Atmos are different things, I would say, because if you're talking about Atmos, let's say you observe an air mass coming in from Russia near Svalbard, and you want to track that, you might do a suitcase flight to Svalbard or so, and you want to revisit the area maybe 24 hours later. That's the kind of Lagrangian we're talking about for air masses. For cryo, we're talking about 
um, you know, days, weeks, maybe even months of tracking these ice parcels. And so, you know, whenever we do have these clear sky conditions, we say, hey, we can revisit ice flow number one million and you know you see what i mean uh so they will each get tagged the way i imagine this and i do think we can do it but you're absolutely right jack this is absolutely crazy <laughs> we just have to somehow make it happen I'm right sorry no, but patrick was talking about lagrangian atmospheric sampling that would follow a process that might take weeks right i mean that was uh, uh, the slide said uh mid-latitude air masses take weeks to turn into arctic air masses so you'd have to sample them repeatedly. But then the, their very next hypothesis said that there's a huge possibility that there's a lot of local input of aerosol. So how can you do a Lagrangian experiment on a mid-latitude aerosol evolution if you're adding a huge amount of new stuff to it? But you you know, over that long time scale, right? I mean, right. it's, a, it's no. a challenge to no. me, I think. So you can't do it all. I mean, obviously, <laughs> if there is a if there is a long lived cloud system, you know, if something hangs out there for weeks, it's going to be impossible. You can't keep the aircraft up for that long, um, long period of time. But you can basically get glimpses of what basically uh, the equilibrium state is at a given time and then return to it, let's say, you know, let's say 24 hours later or even a week later or something like that and say, well, how did that equilibrium change and how was it affected by what were the relevant um, uh, effects that changed the state of equilibrium? I mean, there is this nice Morrison paper from 2012 that basically showed the path, um, uh, how we're envisioning that, basically re regimes and their transitions. Uh, the aerosol piece is particularly difficult, of course. I, I believe that Ralph is on here uh, with Lauren. We've had long, long discussions. And, you know, some of the ACI aspect of, of ARC-6 will have to evolve as actually the science team comes together. So I know this sounds like evasion, but at least uh, I wanted to address this question about Lagrangian, you know, one and Lagrangian two. And sorry, Lynette, I'm talking too much. <laughs> you, you had something. <laughs> no, I was I was just going <laughs> to say um, one thing we learned from Icebridge was, you know, like you have to go into the campaign having way more po flight survey possibilities that, that you want to do than what you can do because you never know exactly what the weather is going to be like and things like that. So that was just, but that was a comment from a while ago. So you want to have a bunch of flight plans planned more than you would ever think fly for that. But, sorry. <laughs> and right, yeah, and, I, uh, I, I, the, and it would be ahead. really beneficial to have these, you know, some mass balance buoys um, deployed so that we can get a better idea of the sea ice drift as well. I mean, that would definitely help <laughs> us plan for that. Thank you, Leonard. Are there other questions? One other thing, Sebastian, you were mentioning the surface stations. I agree that those will be critical. I think um, you mentioned the Danes and I think Billum Research Station, which is Station Nord, is a very good potential contribution. I mean, it sits right at the that northeast corner of Greenland, uh, kind of right in the middle of your, right on the edge of the coastal area there. So. Um, Henrik Skoff is the primary point of contact there. I can send you his contact information, and I think that would be a very good place to have additional instrumentation in place that can kind of monitor atmospheric conditions in real time, in addition to Nialisand and Eureka and Summit and others. But um, that's a very specific bullseye in your study area here. Other questions from the group or comments? I think there are questions in the chat. Uh, yes, there are some questions. So it looks like uh, Lauren uh, asked whether you could share the dry run paper that you mentioned from AC3. I I'll can, it. yes, I can try if there's still time, uh, I can try to share the link to the PDF. Uh, let me Let me go look for that and plop it in there. Okay, thank you. Ralph asked um, about the extent that 
heat fluxes from the ocean below will affect the evolution of Arctic sea ice and whether there will be any constraints on um, horizontal energy flux in the ocean to complement the atmospheric measurements and whether this will be covered adequately by only measuring the freeboard. I guess that's probably a question for Lynette. Yeah, but I, so I don't think we have any um, measurements of the ocean heat flux. I don't think we had planned on doing that. Um, is that correct, Sebastian? And the problem so, yeah, that, is- um, That is, that's correct. Not, so, go, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say the freeboard, measuring the freeboard won't really tell us the amount of heat flux because you know you, it all depending on the service conditions as well like you know the snow and ice thickness and that kind of thing so yeah but Patrick if you have anything else the only other thing I'll add is that yeah there's no plan currently to to directly measure that um the place where I wouldn't guess to, that we could get some information while well, it's going to be imperfect and it's not as good as a direct measurement, but ocean reanalyses could provide us with an idea of how much um, the ocean circulation is uh, bringing heat into this region. So we have a potential, an idea of how much heat could be being brought up through the sea ice, but that's something maybe we need to think a little bit more on to see if there's anything else we can do there. Well, the reason I the reason I asked the question is because doing such a careful job of the energy balance between the atmosphere and the sea ice, and not constraining the ocean flux adequately, might be a significant loose end, and that's why I asked. I mean, the hope is that it's your residual, right? <laughs> I mean, the hope is that if you're accurately measuring sea ice and understanding atmosphere ice energy exchange, and you know that heat potentially also entering the ocean and contributing to bottom melt that yeah there's going to be a part of that that's missing that's your you know ocean vertical um heat flux but yeah I, I, yeah to me to me that would be the, the kind of research questions that follow from a, an experiment like this and we are i think as the white paper writing team we were aware that the ocean piece was missing as actually we were very much aware that the cryospheric piece was missing back when we didn't have it you know we you know the cryospheric piece was just added recently and it really fits together wonderfully um but you know we're gonna have to address this question eventually ralph and alec um so we'll see i mean some of it some of it is just you know not clear yet uh, until we've actually got the science team together Right. Well, if you have the if you have the icebreaker, then you might be able to get some additional constraint on that, don't you think? Yeah, I mean the icebreaker is probably the um, the least likely piece to happen. The surface stations, yes, they will happen. I hope the icebreaker, you know, just depends on Swedish politics. And uh, if we do get it, then we'll only get it in August. And the question is, can we fly as late as August? Where you know, initially we planned to only fly through July, so uh, it's it might be a money question, logistics question. You don't want to rely on other agencies, let alone, you know, other countries. So ideally we'd get it, yes. There are also the Russian drifting stations, but I have no idea where they are right now. I haven't checked in a while. Um, I think I would be surprised if they let them drift that far because there's there's a very clear edge there where anything drifting is going to go into the ocean uh, quickly. All right, well, thank you everyone for this great discussion. We've reached the end of our hour. Um, I don't know uh, whether there are any other questions, but I would recommend people reach out to Sebastian and to Patrick and Lynette for additional details or, or to ask additional questions. Um, we are planning a meeting next month. And Barry, can you remind me whether we were planning to do the Aussies or the technology meeting next month? I thought we were gonna do the Aussies, the Arctic Aussies. Okay, very good. Well, look for additional details on that, but we're planning a meeting on uh, the, the, the use of observing system simulation experiments in the Arctic. Thank you all for joining. Uh, it's always good to see everybody and hopefully many of you will be able to join again next week. Um, 
Barry or Drew, any last comments? Uh, no, I just wanted to point out that Sebastian was able to provide the link to the dry run I uh, did, in the chat. I did put it in the chat. And if you'd like, you can additionally distribute that along with our slide deck uh, to, you know, under some some link. I can yeah, send yeah, yeah. We'll, all of that. We'll, we'll put it on the um, on our collaboration team meeting website. Yeah. With this. Awesome. Yes, we will collect those links and meeting notes. We'll go on the IR IARPIC um, webpage for this meeting. And I believe next week we will have the YouTube link for this meeting up. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Good to see you all. Have a good rest of the week. And Take care. talk to you all soon. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Bye, Thank all. You. Bye.